And we are live. I'm going to ask all the participants to please mute the microphones. And Indra, we can begin. Greetings, everyone. My name is Dr. Indra Selvaraja, and I'm the chair of the Global Crisis Intervention Commission under the World Federation of Music Therapy. Welcome to our special webinar for Ukraine a topic which I know we are all concerned about and eager to dive in. Before we delve into our main content, let me first share with you some important housekeeping rules. This webinar is being recorded and closed captioning will be enabled. For webinar participants, please keep your microphones muted at all times to avoid unnecessary noise. If you have any questions, please feel free to type the questions in the chat box, followed by your name, our panelists will answer your questions during the Q&A portion of the webinar. We will try our best to answer any unanswered questions via email, so please feel free to leave your email so that we can get back to you. The World Federation of Music Therapy is responsible for the content of this webinar. We thank Temple University for providing the technology platform to make it possible. Thank you for your kind cooperation. I'd now like to invite Dr. Anita Swanson, President of the World Federation of Music Therapy to offer her opening remarks. Over to you, Anita. Thank you so much, Indra. Welcome to this special webinar to address a current pressing need. We are troubled about the events that led to this need and share with you our concern. Thank you all for attending and providing support as you can to refugees and persons experiencing trauma. Though this webinar is directed at professional music therapists, I know that there are some other professionals in attendance. We invite you to contact us with any questions you have about music therapy. Thank you to Inja, our Global Crisis Commission's Chair. She has been quite busy since she stepped into this role in July of 2020. I admire her strength, compassion, and ingenuity. Thank you so much for organizing this space for us. Thank you to our presenters for sharing their time, knowledge, and wisdom with us. And thank you to the people who are already assisting displaced people around the world. Music therapy is the professional use of music and its elements as an intervention in medical, educational, and everyday environments with individuals, groups, families, or communities who seek to optimize their quality of life and improve their physical, social, communicative, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual health and well being. Research, practice, education, and clinical training in music therapy are based on professional standards according to cultural, social, and political contexts. Thus, there are some differences among us, yet there are many similarities. The WFMT holds the following values that I believe are relevant to this webinar. We affirm that a safe refuge, well-being, dignity, and education are fundamental human rights. We believe music has a power to heal and promote well-being. We advocate for the use of music to promote equity, social justice, and peaceful resolution. We support a global music therapy network that includes all cultural and ethnic backgrounds, not limited to age, religion, social status, sexual orientation, gender, indigenous heritage, and disability. We encourage open, ongoing communication as the foundation of learning and growth for our profession. And with that, we will move into a learning space. We realize that there will be a lot of information to take in during this time, and there may be things that are uncomfortable to think about. Please take time and care for yourself as you need. This webinar is being recorded, and it will be on the WFMT YouTube channel for later viewing. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Nita, for your inspiring opening remarks, which helped to lay the foundation for our webinar. It is now my privilege to introduce our four panelists, Barbara Else is the consultant and senior advisor policy and research for the AMTA, American Music Therapy Association USA. Her topic today will outline a framework for response and well-being in emergency settings. 
Barbara's practice and scholarship focuses on interventions to mitigate the effects of trauma. Barbara consults domestically and internationally regarding disaster response. She also serves as an advisor for disaster response with the American Music Therapy Association and the World Federation of Music Therapy, and has been active with the American Red Cross and Medical Reserve Corps. Our next panelist, Dr. Elizabeth Coombs, will be sharing about music therapy group sessions for displaced families, why and how. Elizabeth has been a music therapist for over 20 years. She's worked in a range of settings, including Palestinian refugee camps and in Wales, with displaced families either seeking asylum or with refugee status. De developing resilience and building hope form part of her music therapy philosophy with these clients. Our third panelist, Mireya Gonzalez, has worked with refugees and displaced people for 15 years in Canada and crisis intervention in Chile in natural disasters to burn victims and those affected by tsunami and earthquake. Mireya is also the past chair of the World Federation of Music Therapy Global Crisis Intervention Commission. Our final panelist is Dr. Mitzi Akuyuniglo, a lecturer in music therapy at the Department of Music Studies, Ionian University. Mitzi is a professional member with over 30 years clinical experience and a supervisor of the Hellenic Association of Certified Professional Music Therapists, the country representative at the European Music Therapy Confederation and a professional member of the World Federation of Music Therapy. Mitzi's topic today is entitled, What About the Children in This Refugee Journey? Music Therapy as Psychosocial Support in Transit Refugee Camps Based on Psychological First Aid for Children Guidelines. The floor is now yours, ladies. Hello, everyone. I'm Barbara Els, and I'll be kicking off the discussion. And we're, we're handling this, um, even though we thought originally it would start as a small group, it's blossomed because we realize the importance of the topic and the interest because you all care. So thank you to the World Federation of Music Therapy for helping to coordinate this. Thank you for the technology and the use of the platform at Temple as well. To all of you on the call, that are here right now and who may be listening later on. Thank you for joining us to share and chat. And please know that we are here and this is an ongoing discussion. It's not one and done. There will be more and this, it will continue. Uh, we wish the panelists to acknowledge the music therapists from Ukraine and Eastern Europe who are in the heart of this crisis right now. You are not alone. Just being here present to connect now is an important step in working as a network of professionals around the globe. But we also acknowledge that many of you serve uh, in other ongoing refugee situations, as Anita had noted as well, and we want to recognize that. And we'll talk about some of these examples shortly. So with that, um, I wish to share my screen and show you a few images, because I think it might be a little helpful for you to see some key words and ideas as well as hear it. Okay. So my comments will be brief, but the notion is to offer just a quick reference information on uh, a framework for psychological first aid and to think about and ways of thinking about integrating a simple framework into music-based interventions in crisis situations and in particular working with refugees, pers persons in transit and in emergency situations. Let's see here, get this to forward, there we go. So first of all, what is psychological first aid? There are a couple definitions that are out there. The World Health Organization has a very simple definition um, tied to humanitarian effort and caring. It, but it's an evidence-informed modular approach to assist persons of all ages around and in the immediate aftermath of disaster, terrorism, and subject to trauma. So the approach, I'll just slide my screen over here. For assistance during, around, and around conflict is a long-term effort. It's community-focused, and it needs to be an ethical process in order to increase the likelihood of enduring favorable impact on well-being. So it's not um, a one-and-done 
a drive-by, to use an American phrase, in and out kind of thing. It's a commitment in your region, in your local community. Whatever that commitment may be is all right. Psychological first aid was formed into a mini course. And I'm a trainer for the coursework uh, through the Medical Reserve Corps. And that course generally is four to six hours normally. But we're going to do a very condensed version of just the core principles. That's all. I wanted to highlight for you where you can go online with the National Child Traumatic Stress Network for more information about it, the National Center for Post Traumatic Stress Disorder through the Veterans Affairs um, website as well. There are ongoing updates and related research, but overall, the base of evidence for psychological first aid is um, not real strong. And one of the reasons is that conducting research and evaluation in the field is challenging, to say the least. That is another whole conversation and another whole webinar, easily. And I do want to acknowledge the authors in music therapy and creative arts therapies who are writing and publishing on the topics and thank them for this effort. Um, I have a few references at the very end, but there are many. I don't want to forget. Now, let's just go down to the heart of the core principles very briefly. Um, there are five core principles that underpin psychological first aid. You could think about it as sort of the theory of the conceptual model. And so these concepts include providing a sense of safety. That sense of safety doesn't always have to mean you're out of the danger zone, particularly, but in the context of your interaction with individuals, providing a bubble or a container of safety as best you can. Most of my work has been in shelters in the immediate aftermath of disasters and also in post-conflict regions of the world. So safety. The second one is provide a sense of calm or calming. It doesn't mean you can't have energetic children who just want to be children present. That's normal. But providing a sense of calm. The third is the word that they use in psychological first aid is connectedness, a sense of being connected with others. So being here on this call right now is a form of connection for us, especially during a pandemic. But face-to-face -face is even a stronger sense of connection. And perhaps for us as musicians, artists, and music therapists, the use of our tools and music is the greatest form of connection. The fourth key concept, the term they use is self and community efficacy. Now, I know the word efficacy in English can be a little difficult to translate in many other languages that might be present in the room in the space today. So let me rephrase that particular concept. By self and community efficacy in this sense, we're talking about having a sense of purpose, individual purpose, and having a community sense of purpose. Right now in Ukraine, that community purpose has been totally upended and disrupted. Likewise, in neighboring Eastern European countries, in Lithuania, in, in uh, Latvia, Estonia, Moldova, Romania, all of those, that whole entire region, the influx of migrants is changing the community dynamic and you are responding to that, but to provide a sense of purpose. But importantly, how can you use music to provide a sense of purpose and direction? We do it all the time in our clinical practices, but just think about that in the context of responding in this situation. The fifth item is hope, providing a sense of hope. That could be hope in the next hour, a sense of hope and purpose in the next day, in the next month. It can be very short term, but also looking to the future. And we can do that through music and the music we provide as well. So we have five. 
If you were to close your eyes for a moment and think of that circle, try to think through what are those core conceptual grounding elements that would anchor your interactions in an emergency situation. Most often in my practice in these situations when I am deployed, when I'm working in a shelter with the Red Cross or the Medical Corps, my interactions are quite short. In some cases, I am um, even just speaking to people in music terms, like a professional musician that was in a shelter with me and was very depressed and lost um, his home. But we would speak in music terms. What key are you feeling today? And he would give me, I'm feeling E minor. He would give me a musical key. So that's how we communicated. We can use the music in that way to give hope and think through these five core concepts. You take these core principles and you put them into action through your music. But fundamentally, they are to establish safety and security, connect to restorative resources within oneself and within one's support group that might be nearby and the community. They can be used to help reduce stress-related reactions, uh, coping uh, skills. They can help foster adapting to short and long-term coping. And importantly, enhance natural resilience. Um, as opposed to thinking about this as preventing long-term pathology. And you'll see great diversity amongst people and their age groups and development levels on how they're responding to a crisis, and that's normal. So, again, to think about these five core principles, how you might structure brief arts-based techniques, tools, and interventions with evacuees is the main idea I wanted to share with you in my little segment of discussion. But I did wanna say, um, when I thought about the writing of Ellie Scrine, who published last year an article, uh, and I don't want, I wanna make sure I get my notes right. Um, Dr. Scrine encourages music therapists to engage to consider active engagement and participation rather than imposing and pre a predetermined intervention or protocol plan. So you may not hear an intervention protocol from us today because we want our, the individuals with whom we talk to in crises and who are, have evacuated to have control over the situation. So participation led by them, and Mitzi will speak to this some more when, when she speaks, and having a voice is critically important in this process and using the music driven by the clients for that end. A couple of real, real quick, simple examples. Um, a sense of connection in a shelter situation to meet um, all kinds of persons uh, needs persons with disabilities because uh, shelters are going to have a cross section of society there. Um, elders, vulnerable, um, healthy people coming with pre existing medical conditions. If you use um, this, is a picture of Dr. Nemeth working with a child uh, doing a rhythm name gaming, name game. My name is Barbara with a little bit of rhythm with the instrument, something very simple, and it provides a connection and the beat provides a bit of grounding. We can think about using music as a milieu, an environment, a container. It can help mask noise in an environment. Likewise, you might be asked to consult on helping to create quiet spaces or quiet zones in shelters. People have been bombarded with lots of noise and crowds and they may need a quiet environment. We can use music as a container to help create a calming space, even if it's loaning someone a pair of headphones. Keep in mind that listening and listening alone is an intervention. Likewise, simply being present, sitting next to someone is an intervention and give yourselves permission to be present with people.
I've spoken about music as a grounding element, but uh, you probably all have worked with, at some point, uh, breathing exercises with music. I've done them in very short, abbreviated moments for people that are highly activated and overwhelmed and just cued myself with them to take a breath. And I've used rhythm in the process of speaking with them to help in that process. And I rely a good deal on modulating my voice in that, in that effort. These are military families who are parents are coming back and forth from deployment at a military base um, in the United States. And we were working with the children who were having trouble with the shift in family dynamics and were having some overwhelmed crisis moments. So music may or may not be involved in crisis intervention situations and in emergency situations. I carry a small kit with me when I am deployed uh, to keep it portable. And I have a cleaning kit with it now as well uh, that I use always. You may be asked to help relieve parents from caregiving and engage children with music activities. They need time to play and to express themselves as well. Off-duty hours and uh, music programs for emergency workers and responders, I spend actually now the majority of my time working with police, military, firefighters, first and what's called second responders, and we'd probably be under that category, as well as clergy um, on their well-being. You need to take care of yourselves. And, but in these off-duty programs, uh, we've done improvisation groups. And the term in English, we've done kitchen bands. And that's where you may not have all the musical instruments you normally might use handy, or it's awkward to carry them around. So we're using pots and pans and spoons and pencils, that kind of thing. Songwriting to communicate thoughts and feelings. Um, using music in recovery and as a means of social support in music therapy. Choirs and singing, Mitzi will speak to that as well um, as the other panelists shortly. This picture is a youth orchestra in the Southwest of the United States after a major uh, disaster event. Composing music, working with a music therapist, they were composing their own relaxation music. So they had previous music background from their school music program, and they were just gathering again about six weeks after the major event. Music therapy and mindfulness techniques are um, often used. Techniques from guided relaxation and breathing, and you may have already heard or read about adapting guided imagery and music techniques in certain emergency situations. Music making as a constructive expression of energy and emotions, using the ISO principle starting where they're at or creating a song cycle, uh, to use a term uh, coined by Dr. Dilio. We use music uh, with sleep disturbances because that's very common in people who are actively transiting uh, in shelters and on the move um, and to help them in that process. And I mentioned before, music for masking a noisy environment. In terms of your own self-care, um, I think this is a critically important point, set of points. I wanna be sure that you think about rotating your duties, varying your levels of exposure to stressors and asking for support if you need it, including regular supervision. I could not continue in this area of work for so many years if I did not seek counseling myself. Uh, conducting case meetings uh, with a clinical supervisor or mentor, uh, peer support, peer consultation and peer partners. In the States, we call them peer buddies. And those can be people who get online remotely like this, just to check in with you. Know your limits, boundaries, and personal needs so that you can be well and healthy and be honest with yourself about that and practice healthy self-care. Don't be afraid to have um, a little fun and uh, allow yourself some humor too. It's serious business, but it's important to have um, some recreation time. 
work, typically we work with partners or in a teams. In some situations in the immediate emergency event, if you're in the middle of it, that may not be possible. But typically have a partner or work in a team. Be alert for triggers or reminders uh, among, with the people you're working with and for yourself. I worry sometimes about use of percussion instruments if there's been explosions and bombs and working with the military. And that actually, the groups I've worked with hasn't been a huge concern, but a trigger or reminder could be a smell. It could be a, it could be a song. It could be an instrument or a sound. It could be a helicopter overhead. You, you never know what it could be, but be alert for that and observe for that because we don't want to re-traumatize evacuees. Um, develop what I call trauma awareness. Now, we're not going to be talking about trauma-informed care principles on this call today, but I wanted to highlight that that goes hand in hand with those core principles of psychological first aid. I already mentioned considered need for recreation and downtime as well. I have just a few um, references that I, I cited here. There's many more, and I've started putting together a packet of references that we can make available, um, at, at least abstracts at a minimum. Uh, but I did want to highlight Ellie Skrine's uh, article uh, and some references on psychological first aid as well and the Child Traumatic Stress Network. So having said that, there's five core principles in psychological first aid, safety, calming, connectedness, a sense of self and community purpose, and hope. Probably someone on the call right now could put those into a chant or a song, and then you'll have them down pat. You can remind yourself of that as you think about your interactions with people. So having thought a little bit about a conceptual framework, and we're not going to get into all the theoretical approaches and philosophical approaches that you might bring to the table, they're all important. I wanna pass it over to my colleague, Dr. Liz Coombs, to talk a little bit about thinking about structuring the session and uh, give her the floor now. So I will stop sharing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bob. I, I, I'm Something that really struck me in your uh, presentation then particularly was you talking about creating quiet spaces because I think sometimes when we're in these situations we start to go into doing mode and it's really important to have that that idea also of being present and being and this just thinking about what the sounds might mean and how somebody might need that quiet space don't you think? Absolutely. And in some shelter situations, some very simple things can make a huge difference. Positioning where you're seated near a person, um, making sure that a cot for someone who needs to be closer to the bathroom is actually closer to the bathroom. Um, providing and seeking a space or maybe going outside as long as it's safe to take a walk with someone. Shall we take a walk and just take in the evening air for a little bit and get mm -hmm. out of the noise and being with and present and quiet, even if there's a lot of ambient sounds around you, your presence and that energy in, in American English, we'd say your vibe can have a huge effect in these situations. So uh, mm -hmm. thanks for asking that. So when you think about, um, uh, Liz, when you think about the work you've done in Palestine, and consulting uh, around the world. And we've talked numerous times over the years about this. How do you go about approaching uh, your work? Are you doing groups? Are you doing single sessions? And, and, and who's driving the structure for that? That's a really good question. Um, I guess it's, I, I suppose for me, it's thinking about being adaptable and flexible. So for me, it may be that I might I might have that wonderful thing of a plan, um, but I'm absolutely ready to respond in the moment and, you know, throw out whatever I felt that was my little comfort, my little comfort list <clears throat> and go with whatever with whatever's needed, really. Um, so it's it's for me, it's about having lots and lots of of things at my fingertips that I feel I can go to. 
whilst being respectful of what's actually in the room or, or around me there and, and what they might need. So it's kind of it's kind of a sort of a, a two way thing. There isn't there isn't. I know it would be wonderful um, to have this sort of set plan of, of, of what would work. And I think um, when I'm teaching my students, they often sort of I can see in their eyes they want the, uh, you know, such an activity plus this equals you know improvements but that sort of is the is the wonderful thing about music therapy that that it isn't something set it can be individualized it's adaptable and it's flexible and I think that's what's what's really important so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share my screen I don't have a large number of slides it may be that I might talk to the slides for a while and then I'll stop sharing and I will carry on my conversation with you guys and we'll see where we go. So I will share my screen now. Okay. There we go. Before I um, talk any more, I just want to say a little bit about myself. So I'm from the UK and I just want to acknowledge the fact that I'm a white woman. I've had the privilege of education. I've gone to university. I've never um, been involved in any kind of invasion of my homeland. That has never happened to me. The work that I have done has always been responding to other countries, other con conflict zones, um, or people who have come to my country for assistance. So um, I don't speak from a position of being in the same situation of many people who are on this call. And I just wanna make that absolutely clear that there will be people here who have very, very valuable experiences that I'm sure I can learn a lot from. So uh, I'm hoping that today I'm going to learn some things from participants here as well. So since 2009, I've worked in conflict zones um, using music therapy to offer therapeutic support, mainly for children. And a bulk of the work that I have carried out has been in the area of doing that work myself, but also training people to deliver what I call interactive therapeutic music making groups. Gosh, that's a bit of a mouthful. But what it's trying to express is that these are not, it's not music therapy that I'm training people to do necessarily, but it is something about using music interactively for therapeutic aims. And within that, I would share music therapy principles with people who want to learn how to work in that way. Now, I'm going to park that topic for now because this webinar isn't really about that, but I'm putting this out there for people just to have a think that as this work develops, it may be something that people may wish to do. Bar was talking about um, working with people, working with peers, and I'm going to talk a little bit about also having a partner in the work that you do who, who may not be a music therapist. So some of this might be happen happening organically as you go along, that you're giving some of your skills to someone else. But it might also be something later on um, that becomes an intentional part of a programme or a piece of work or um, a piece of support that's being done so that other people also are able to use music in a supportive way. So in the UK, um, I've carried out music therapy with small groups of asylum seeking families who have been, who've come to the UK and have settled in Wales. And the goal in that has been to support them in developing a sense of belonging and hopefulness for the future. So what I want to talk about today is just give you a kind of a sense of the sort of things I might do 
in such a group because I think it can be useful to have an idea of a structure, although that structure may need to go out of the window. And it's also, it's my structure. So it, it speaks to me, it may not speak to you. So thinking um, just a little bit before we go into that, I'm just gonna reiterate some of the psychological first aid principles that Barb talked about. This idea of a safety in the group this idea of connectedness. And there's also something about being physically connected that I'm gonna mention in some of the things that I do as well, as well as this connectedness of us doing something together. A calmness that I'm trying to hold within myself in the hope that that will then come through in the work that I'm doing and that the people in the group will also begin to have a sense of that. that. We've got a sense of purpose in the group that there's a reason why we're doing something and this, this, this hope that we are in a situation that is very difficult but that together there is something that we can do about it. So how are we going to achieve this in music therapy? We're going to match what we're going to do with those principles I've just talked about, the psychological first aid. We're gonna think about selecting a structure. It could be that one that we actually don't end up using, but I think it's, I think it's actually helpful for you as, as the person that's doing that work to do that. We're gonna apply some music therapy techniques and something that's very, very important. And I just know um, the wonderful Maria Gonzalez is gonna talk a little bit about this later. We're going to offer some creativity because I really believe that offering that creativity is a very special gift that we can give to people. And it's something that we can do in many, many different ways, even in very, very difficult situations. And I think that is a very, very supportive thing to offer. And it also links to my beliefs about hope. Yeah, that through creativity, we can we can develop and build this idea of hopefulness. So I'm going to give you um, a little uh, I'm going to talk through now. A group that I worked with um, and I'm going to give you um, maybe just a little story about the group. OK, so. Um, I was very fortunate enough to be offered the opportunity to work with some asylum seeking families in my home city. And I was also fortunate enough to have a partner in that activity. And partner wasn't a musician, wasn't a music therapist, um, had been a, a school teacher for very young children. And her job was to support the families in helping them access the group, so actually get to the group, uh, and so any other practicalities that there might be around that. And my main role was to then deliver the group and keep the families engaged, make them feel that in Wales, we were very um, pleased that they'd come to be with us, and that we wanted them to feel that this is somewhere where they can live, that they can you know, be part of our community and we're all in it together. Before we ran the group, what we actually did was we went and met each of the families that had been referred to us for that particular group. So we went to where they were living, met them, had lots and lots of cups of tea, lots of coffees, and I also took some instruments because I was really interested to see how the children would engage with the instruments and the music, what, whether they were curious, whether they were very shy or withdrawn. And it was a very, very mixed bag, really, of instruments and a very mixed bag of children as well. Some of the children were um, extremely traumatized and couldn't speak. Some of the children, the trauma that they'd experienced showed itself in different ways. So it, 
felt a little bit like there might be emerging um, additional learning needs, but that could also have been uh, trauma. Um, some of the children were notably aggressive. And I wasn't quite sure, I'll be honest, how it was all going to fit together and whether it was actually going to be um, that other word that Barb mentioned, safe. You know, I was very keen for it to feel like a safe space. So I thought very hard about how to work with such a disparate um, group of children. And the families also were from very different parts of the world. So we didn't have a common language. We didn't have one language um, that we use. We could use an interpreter for. So we had uh, family from Albania, family from Egypt, um, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. So we actually had four different families. And we decided, myself and my wonderful um, co-worker, that we wouldn't have interpreters because we felt that was going to be more people in the room. And um, we felt that, that we felt confident, actually, that we could manage our communication with what we had, with the music, with natural human communication um, and the music. So um, off we set. One of my um, co-workers jobs was to support um, families to get to the place that we were having the group and that involved her actually supporting them to use local transport so actually visiting them and helping them use buses um, which was really really helpful because then they were able to use those skills to to move around the city um, and we also provided some refreshments after the main body of the group. And some of the refreshments were um, specialties from Wales, my homeland. So we had some special kind of cakes and drinks, things like that, um, just to make them feel this, this, this idea of connectedness. Because the children were very young, these were preschool children. And we also had, um, one baby within one of the families who was only six weeks old. And we had another um, child who was only 14 months. They were all, they were all in the group with their siblings. Um, I chose an opening physical activity that I have used many times also in my work in Palestine with groups. And it actually uses a piece of recorded music with a fairly steady rhythm and it's actually a piece of material. So it's uh, a band, like, like a ribbon, but it's stretchy. So it's in a big circle with little bells on it and little pretty bits of color. And we all hold this elastic together. Okay, so we are physically connected and we can feel each other's movements. And so we, we put the music on and we're actually all physically connected and we're joined on with this um, piece of material and we're sort of bouncing around and we can do different things. We can go up, we can go down, we can go this way and this way to the beat, steady beat. And it, it immediately, I have found that that activity immediately centers and grounds the group. Um, it allows people to have movement but feeling the other person's movement next to you is a very, very powerful thing. Um, and it, it just really seems to bring everyone together in a physical sense and an emotional sense as well. So once that, um, that is over, that, that, that's something that I've, oft, I've often used, I will try, maybe try something without instruments because I'm, I'm aware that there are going to be, there's going to be some work that's going to be happening and equipment is going to be something that's going to be an issue. And Barb was actually also talking about sometimes perhaps being a bit wary of what instruments you are using because they could, the sounds could be triggering as well. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm a big believer in body percussion. And I think that also gives the opportunity for people to feel a little more grounded, touching their own bodies, 
exploring and making these different sounds that we can do, these different sensations, very simple. And it gives us the idea of perhaps following a leader. Other people can become leaders and people can begin, we can begin to pick up on different things that people are doing. And we can begin to get a sense of what the people that we're working with, what the children are doing, what they're, what they're about, what they're like. It's what we do as musicians and music therapists, isn't it? We begin to understand and to think about the people we're working with in a musical way. What I've also used then is something about connecting with instruments. In this particular group, I was very fortunate um, to have a very, very large sharing drum. So a very, very big drum that we could, we could put on the floor and was enough for about 10 of us, it was very, very big, that we could actually put our hands on it. So we could all put our hands on this at the same time. And again, this sense of connectedness, that we could feel each other's movements and we can see what we're doing as well. So we can start to be creative and take the lead from what other people are doing in the group and begin to notice and to follow each other and to build up something as a group that we're doing. Something else that um, I found really useful, and I'm thinking particularly of connections and also moving on to helping some of the children who were very, very um, afraid of making vocal sounds. I've said clickers, they're just like the castanets, just the little clicks. I haven't got one in the room with me at the moment. I'll try and find one later for you. Um, but just the thing that you just click it like this. And so again, just, just, just making sounds with those and trying to get the children to use them to like oh, make a sound with their voice. Um, some children, very quick to do that, of course. Some of the children, I, th I think we had one, one young girl who, who on the very, very last session we had, she managed to make a sound. It was so, it was such a powerful moment. It was amazing because she'd been so uh, unable to use her vocal sound. Barb also was talking a little bit about the music of our clients and something being led by them. So I, I, I like to have this, this aspect of a group that we might just call it freestyle, yeah? Not chaotic, something that's got maybe a steady beat and we might have some other percussion. And this is where we actually um, might get some music developing from the group. Um, so some of the mums in the groups that we had were singing, maybe using some of their country specific music. And some of the younger children, I remember one, one little boy doing some amazing um, Albanian folk dancing, um, just because he just was just caught up in the moment. And it was wonderful to see that movement being used in a really purposeful way. So maybe thinking about that link here that Barb was saying about the, the purpose so one of the purposes of this, because what was happening with that particular child was he was using his movement very aggressively and for attacking purposes. To, so to see that energy being channeled into creativity, into movement, into something very culturally specific that then, you know, with the other children were very curious about and were trying to, to see what it felt like to move like that was wonderful. And also something that I think is very important, um, <clears throat> something to think about offering, and it perhaps speaks also to my interest in this creating a quiet space, that within the group, creating a, a quieter time for families to have some physical closeness and cuddles. So using maybe a guitar, something melodic with a very simple two chords maybe, framework and it could be maybe a folk song that the, the group you're working with is familiar with in their language um, or it could be something that's non-verbal just some vocalizing that has that time so you as the music therapist are offering this opportunity for a piece of music that is for holding that is for families to have that time together to have positive touch, positive experiences, just 
that someone else is taking charge of providing that space. They haven't, it's not something they've got to go and find that opportunity. The opportunity is here. And that was a very, very important, that, that, that for me, that's a very important part of a group piece of music making, that there's that opportunity. And then something that's very, very clear that the group is ending so that the experience is sealed. Yeah, so the music ends, maybe, maybe if you're doing this as part of, a, of an actual group structure, you can segue into an ending song, perhaps make that more appropriate to an ending. Now, each of these activities that I've talked about here, as I said, I had the opportunity to run that through as a group, but you could take each of these as a one-off thing that you could do as a toolkit that you can try. Um, Bob was talking a little bit about having quite maybe the interventions or the moments you have with people are very short. And in which case there could be opportunities for each of these to become something just as a one-off moment that's appropriate and just fits with what's needed. So there's the opportunity to adapt that. Why did I choose those things? To me, they're simple. They're well within what I know that I can offer. They feel safe. I feel confident in delivering them. And I think that's, that's a really important thing to feel confident in what you can deliver. I think they encourage connectedness in some quite physical ways, actual connectedness, as well as emotional connectedness, and connectedness through rhythm and music. They allow the group's own music to come into play. And there's also a sense of purpose and also, of course, a distraction as well. Something that's, that's just taking somebody into a different space. Just a little bit of relief from the situation that they're in. I think that's, that's a very, very important thing. And I've just put a couple of things here as my, my watchwords at the end, which is Try and work in pairs. I, I found it so, so helpful to have someone with me. It was amazing. Um, even just, just the, pra the practicality of it, of having somebody be able to pop and put a kettle on so that you're going to have a night, everyone's going to have a hot drink at the end and um, sort that out. Or, or just some, somebody else to just hold the group uh, while you're getting the next bit of, bit of equipment ready. Um, and I think it's, it's lovely to model that working in a pair as well. Um, it just has to be good enough what you do. It doesn't, there's nothing, you don't have to be perfect. It just has to be good enough. And I really think that adaptability um, is the key. Thanks ever so much for listening. I've put my email up there. Um, if anybody wants to get in touch, you are very welcome. I'm trying to stop sharing. So I'm while she's sharing. While Liz has stopped sharing there. Um, thank you, Liz. When, when Liz used the word cuddles, uh, that might not, that's a, that's a kind of a UK term that basically means hug in, in case that didn't translate in the transcript. <laughs> so a cuddle would be a hug with your family member in that family group setting that she was talking about. Thanks so much, Liz. Um, mm. Liz, you talked about, uh, you talked about songs that were familiar and dances in the case of the folk dance with a young man. Um, and as we, as we turn to Maria. Uh, she sang for me a song from one of her groups in Chile in responding to an emergency that was about, um, it was a, a, a old folk song about the ocean and the water, absolutely beautiful. And even if me as um, a white woman from North America, I don't know that song. As a musician, we can, I could hear the excerpt of this beautiful melody, maybe she'll tell us the name of that again, the name of the melody. And I could take that melody, that snippet of melody and bring it to a group as well. We do, we do similar things mm. um, with young, young children, uh, new, new parents with premature infants um, in Joanne Lowy's intervention style. You, take, you can take a snippet of a lullaby, for example. You might not need to know the whole piece of music. Um, and I don't pretend to know that. So thank you so much, Liz. And we'll move mm. over to um, Maria to see what she uh, would like to share with us about creativity in her groups. In fact, uh, 
Well, thank you to my, both of my colleagues. Uh, very inspiring presentations. And uh, now I understand why we are all together here, because we have such a similar uh, philosophical approach to trauma and crisis. So maybe we are starting a trend. I don't know. <laughs> so um, I will share my screen. Okay, can you see it? Yes, we're good, Maria. Okay, great. So um, today I will talk a little bit about the practical approach. Um, both of my colleagues have talked a little bit about the um, psychological first aid principles. And Liz, uh, in a very nice way, also describes some of the practical uh, activities that she's done with her groups. And I will we'll take it a little farther and talk about the music therapy th team. Uh, this would be like in an ideal situation that when crisis uh, happens somewhere and we have to, we want to go or we, we are asked to go, uh, we would, you know, uh, be experienced clinicians, you know, we've had a lot of uh, um, education in crisis intervention. We will also be provided with ongoing peer support or supervision. We will have a very good understanding uh, of the cultural and the, the, the geographical area that we are going to. And uh, ideally, the music therapist will be very flexible with lots of energy and humor to be able to confront all of these challenges. And of course, we will have, you know, lots of resources to be able to travel and to provide um, uh, clinical services for a long time. And also we'll be, you know, um, be very good at research or um, we'll have people with us. But the reality is very different, as we all know. So um, I'm very happy that we are able to, to do this today in order for us to share a little bit of our experience and then continue on uh, giving uh, support in any way we can. But uh, having said this, um, when we in Chile had a, an earthquake uh, in 2010, I, I didn't have a lot of experience uh, in working in the field in the trauma and crisis. And uh, so what I'm sharing here is what I learned along the way, making many, many mistakes and being very humble about it. So the first thing we realized we had to do, even though we had the best intention, intentions in going to the site, um, the same when we, we've been confronted with a large uh, wildfires, is that uh, you think that you have the answers to go and help these people. And when you get there, you realize that their needs are very different. So it's really important to, to contact or talk to the local authorities, other organizations, or, or people that are organizing the help uh, at the shelter or at the site that you are at. Also, uh, the role of the music therapy team and support has to be very clear when you present yourselves because uh, in a lot of places they don't even know what music therapy is. So uh, you need to have that clear within yourself and within the group uh, you are leading or, or as a team member. And the most important thing is to assess the needs of the clients um, because sometimes if the clients don't have shelter, you know, they, they are injured, they don't need to be somebody singing a song for them. They need water, they need uh, snacks, they need to be safe. Uh, so we really have to assess the material needs versus the emotional needs and when we can come in. Probably it's not going to be at the very beginning of the crisis. And uh, also it's very important to, to be aware of the culture 
and geographical concerns or anything that's happening uh, in the area with, with uh, the clients. Because even though, for example, when I worked at uh, for the people of the earthquake, um, this was, I went south, I live in the center of Chile and our cultural beliefs are very different. Our ways of doing things are very different. Even though we speak the same language, sometimes I could not understand what they meant. And uh, uh, for example, you know, uh, will they be working, uh, sitting on the floor on cushions or would they rather be sitting on chairs? You know, what, what's their usual way of doing it? So it's really important to be very sensitive to when you confront a group, uh, what their needs are and what they really want to do. And uh, uh, also to be really aware of the scope of service, you know, how long are we committing to be there? What's going to be the timing that we're going doing services? What kind of clients will we have? Are we going to have uh, adults? Are we going to have children? Are we going to have uh, groups um, or one-on-one -on -one sessions? And also, uh, who else is there collaborating? You know, there are usually several um, humanitarian organizations around uh, and everything is going very fast. There's lots of uh, help that's coming in. Uh, so we really have to, in a way, become a little bit invisible, you know, but be, be where we are needed, not where we think that we could uh, collaborate. And then we have all of the ethical concerns uh, that Barb mentioned, you know, at the beginning, what do we do? We, we would really like to leave this, uh, this work like to be seen for the world and write a paper. But uh, in my case, for example, uh, I have never been able to do that because I'm always there doing stuff. So it's, you know, it's really helpful if you would have a team to back you up. Uh, also with the evaluations or the uh, audiovisual consents, you know, you, you have to be sensitive to those needs uh, more than what you need to, to get to be presenting uh, at another time. So the needs of the clients that you are serving are always the most important uh, thing that to be considered. Uh, in many cases of in my work, uh, right now I work in a, in a rehab place for children who have suffered burn injuries, um, as well as uh, other works that I've done on site. Uh, it's really important to consider the frontline workers, like the, the health uh, personnel, the firefighters, the police, uh, teachers, um, daycare teachers, because they will be working with the community one-on-one -on -one once all the help is gone. So it's really important to, to give them a space for catharsis, but also to give them some creative tools that they can uh, do with their clients um, or in any group they work after, you know, and how they can use music and, and creativity like drawing or stories uh, in order to, to calm the people and offer um, really uh, solid emotional support. Also, uh, after that, we go to the community at large. You know, there, there, are, there are maybe groups of parents that need support, uh, parents and their children, or children alone, or adolescents. Um, usually the seniors and, and younger kids are most as, at risk. So in this, in this case, for the earthquake, we prioritize the seniors groups and the, the children with their parents. And by having, uh, we were lucky to be able to take all of our instruments because there was nothing there. Um, and by having the instruments and just exploring them, uh, already gave them a sense of, uh, of control of something. They could play any way they wanted. Um, then they could sing anything they wanted and they would choose the songs uh, or not. And... Um, uh, Liz mentioned something about, you know, having an improvisation, but having some sort of guidance so it wasn't disorganized. Uh, sometimes when people are very um, agitated, you know, because uh, crisis or trauma, they really need to be met where they are at. So, you know, the, sometimes we would say, well, we cannot have groups for more of 15 people, but then we would get there and there would be 35 people, so we would have to take that in. So that's where the flexibility comes in. And the improvisations would be 
wild. I mean, they would be very noisy, very disorganized. And after a while, the group would start, you know, falling into some sort of a synteny with, with their sounds and listen to each other. Uh, so that was very, very beautiful. We, we were there just, you know, as sort of um, uh, not even leaders, just to accompany them and the group would organize themselves. Sometimes uh, you'll, be, uh, you'll have to do one-on-one -on -one services as well. And uh, uh, it's, it's very important that also in that type of session, you just um, be, give whatever you have to give. Uh, don't feel that you are not doing enough. Uh, you know, if in a session they ask you that they are hungry or they are uh, thirsty or that they need medicine, uh, don't feel that you have to do all that or provide all that. There's always other people that can do that. So uh, it's really important to, to be aware of, of your own limitations, physically and in material. Um, but like I mentioned before, I didn't have much experience work in the field, so um, with the help of uh, several of my colleagues, uh, Barb included, I came up with this uh, three-phase method that really helped me uh, to organize um, all of the sessions and, and that the time that we, we were there and also the work that I've been doing with uh, victims of, um, of fires and, and burns in the last uh, while. So first we offer a session where people can, can know where they are at the moment, how they feel, what they need to um, uh, express or not. I mean, silence is very uh, useful as well at some times. Once we do, could be one session, two, three, as many as that group needs or that person needs, we would go on to the second phase, which is the awareness of the strengths and resources that they may have, either as individuals or as a group. So for example, in a group, you know, there might be people that are really funny and others that are tend to be more depressed. Maybe they can, you know, work together and, and see where they can uh, support each other in that way. Um, or, you know, in the case where they have to rebuild uh, a community, maybe there are some workers that can help, you know, uh, the seniors who lost their homes and, and uh, things like that. And the last, um, the last phase would be the work together on individual or common goals. So this is a, um, it's a community resilience theory um, that I, I use and I, I found at the time. And uh, the people get together and work through a common goal being emotionally or um, active material. And, uh, uh, and then they, they, they become like uh, partners, you know, in, in, in their little communities or in their city. Um, and the drawings that you see at the bottom were done by adolescents that had this dream of having trees everywhere in this little town that was completely collapsed by the earthquake. So each one of them, you know, was, was um, a piece of this um, making, it, uh, making it together again. And what we did exactly and what we do now with all of our clients, it's first uh, having contact with your body and your breathing. If you just now take one moment, you know, to close your eyes and really feel your body or, or listen to the sounds around you and take a deep breath and, you know, count three or four times when you are breathing in, three or four times when you are breathing out. And even just having, you know, five, 10 seconds of this breathing, it will really put you in contact with your body and maybe not so fast with your emotions, but at least you'll get your body movement uh, and being present at the time and seeing other people and walking around the room and that could be with music or without music. Sometimes, you know, people don't have electricity or, you know, uh, well, now with all the uh, technology, we can skip that. But uh, it really depends on what the group wants. And sometimes it's better not to have any music at all and people just listen, you know, to the sounds that they are making. Um, after that, we can do an improvisation, you know, free improvisation, guided improvisation. 
uh, singing with their own songs. Like Barb said, you know, you, they pick up a song and then they can uh, sing along or you can pick on that and do other tunes with the same with the same words or the same melody and always choose the client's music first you know what what are they bringing what songs they remember uh, you know the kids song what do you know or um, for the seniors you know they have all their songs like the song that Barb mentioned uh, it's a song that's called Que Grande Que Viene El Rio, Que Grande Se Va La Mar, which is, you know, how big the river is coming and how big it, it's going to the ocean. And that refers to the, to the tsunami that we had. Um, also include, uh, I have included, still do, uh, musical drawing. Uh, for example, the trees, we would uh, put music to them, uh, you can do paintings, you can musicalize stories, you can do parades, uh, and in general what we found is that kids are very hyperactive and older people or adults tend to be more quiet, so you really have to see where, where the happy medium would be for the different activities that you do. And also consider, you know, the individual or the group characteristics to, to go about that. Um, we serve, for example, firefighters that they didn't want to talk about anything uh, that was uh, bad for them, uh, but other people really wanted to discuss what had happened to them. So you have to take into account uh, what, where they are coming from and always leave time for verbal discussion, even if, if, even if nobody wants to say anything, you know, just open the floor to for people to say what what they felt or how they liked the the music or the instruments or the movement uh, because that also we get you know people sort of connecting with their with their own feelings so many settings could be um, prepared uh, even if you don't have anything you can use your body uh, sounds with your hands or you know clapping the floor or the walls um, here in this picture you see different settings uh, that we've had to work on and uh, um, not everybody, I think people deal with, uh, with trauma in different ways and with sadness in different ways so we, we shouldn't be judgmental if people are laughing or you know having a great time uh, that means that they don't care. I think it's we really have to help people express themselves in any way they know how. So a few recommendations. First of all, be present where you are. Uh, be aware of your own um, strengths and weaknesses. Uh, don't be afraid to share them. Uh, be flexible in whatever you do. If, uh, if it's one person, it's 50 people or, you know, anywhere you are, just try to, to, to have your own self as the first instrument if you don't have anything else and ask for support. Always uh, call out for, for um, colleagues. Um, without my colleagues all over the world, I wouldn't have been able to do this. And be supportive. Uh, always be supportive of colleagues. Um, make an effort uh, to reach, to, to be able for other people to reach you. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Morea. Um, it's Barb. And um, one question I had uh, perhaps for you to comment on, because I knew I know you were commuting with your um, colleague uh, from Santiago because there was no place to stay there in the earthquake setting, that is. So you'd either have to camp out. So you'd commute back and forth each week or every two weeks when you went down there. Um, who who was your biggest source of um, information in that community? in that township, in that region, as to how to prioritize because the needs were greater than the time and resources that you both had on each visit. Was it the mayor? Was it a nurse? Was it the priest? Um, just wanted to get your comment on that. Okay. Uh, yeah, we, when we got there, we, we actually um, tried to see who the, the person that was organizing all the help was and uh, in small towns here in Chile it's usually the mayors and I imagine in other places are you know similar uh, people like that but also the, the priest of the town it was very very important um, to talk to him because he knew people uh, 
in, in closeness uh, and also the, the health personnel because they know where, what their needs are, what their immediate uh, mental health needs are. So uh, those three areas really sort of guided us, you know, to be able to, um, to service and to each time, you know, we got better at it uh, on how to, to reach through the groups. Many of the groups reached us. So you, you just have to be present. Sometimes, you know, we would we would go every weekend and we would just sit in the main plaza for hours, you know, thinking, what do we do now? And somebody would come up to us and say, you know, could you go and, and do a session, you know, in, in that community because they are having problems within themselves. And, you know, if that was a need, we would go and do whatever they, I mean, we would be available for the, what their needs were. Right, thank you. So, so far um, I talked about, um, some key concepts in the immediate aftermath of an emergency and a crisis, like in uh, temporary shelters. And then uh, Liz talked about adapting to new environments in her group in groups in Wales, the example. And Mareas talked about the recovery period in a post-emergency crisis situation and uh, over a longer period of time. So I think um, let's give Mitzi a little bit of time on the floor to talk about her work, which I think has direct relevance to the Ukraine situation. Mitzi, thank you very much, Maria, and I'll pass it over to Mitzi. Hi, everyone. Um, it's really um, wonderful hearing everything that you guys have said already. Um, really, a lot of things uh, are cover, you know, cover, which cover, cover each other. And um, the situation here is rather different because I have worked in transit refugee camps, which is uh, what um, the countries around Ukraine are forming right now for the Ukrainian people fleeing their homes. And um, it's a very different situation that we face within the transit camps. Um, 2015 was characterized as the long summer of migration for Europe and for other countries, of course, because there were so many uh, refugees coming. And because of where I live, I live in Hios Island. I will show you a map. Um, the, um, it's so close that it, it was a first port of entry for many uh, refugees arriving through here. Um, so my setting is a bit different. And um, I agree with Mireya, it is a very challenging um, place to be. And um, we really need to have uh, ears open and eyes open to see what exactly is needed. Um, Catherine Russell, she's the executive director, to, director of UNICEF, uh, posted a couple of days ago that among uh, refugees fleeing now Ukraine are hundreds of thousands of children. And many of them are unaccompanied or separated from their families. So I'm gonna uh, talk drawing from my experience uh, working as a music therapist with refugee children in transit camps since 2015 uh, on a volunteer basis. And uh, I will share insight on ways to approach and conduct, uh, but we have to keep in mind that all transit camps and all camp situations are different. Um, transit camps are places where housing is uh, not permanent, a refugees stay there temporarily. And um, while being in a transit camp, actually you feel like your life is in limbo. Um, in other words, they are suspended between um, what their life used to be and what their life might be in the future. And being in this liminal space of no longer having a home and not knowing where one is going makes the period of being in a transit camp a time of fear stress, uncertainty, and of an unknown tomorrow. Now, there are a number of phases that have been identified in this involuntary dislocation journey in order to describe best the pre-flight, flight, and post-flight stages. But I think the flight stage, uh, as Renos Papadopoulos has proposed the term that actually describes um, what I have seen to survival. Refugees are focused on their survival during the uh, that period in the transit camps. Talking now about refugee children, all acts of violence jeopardize children's well-being and compromise their healthy development. 
and the refugee journey holds many adversities for children. Abruptly, without warning or preparation, they are forced to leave their home and everything around it. Their room and toys, their neighborhoods, their friends, school activities, everything that has been familiar to them, and they live in haste and fear of their lives. Papadopoulos, in discussing the adversities that refugees face, has talked a lot about the concept of home and all that it encompasses in our lives, describing its utmost significance. This also highlights the complex reality that refugee children experience to the bone during this taxing time. Homelessness, involuntary dislocation, hostile and strange environment of a transit refugee camp, and anxiety and fear that have overwhelmed their parents and caregivers. Before I give you information on the refugee situation in Hills Island in order to set the scene, I want to stress again that each refugee camp situation might be the same and yet very different. It is good to have that in mind when I describe the music therapy groups that took place within formal and makeshift refugee camp here in Hills. Uh, I will narrate my experience in hope that it might be useful to the, for those of you who are working with refugee children or are planning to do so. So Greece is one of the countries of entry to Europe and specifically Hios Island, as you can see on the map, uh, has served as a first point of entry for a large number of refugees from Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, and many more countries due to its close proximity to the Turkish shorelines, but it is not their final destination. So as I mentioned earlier, their time in Chios Island is a time of waiting without a time chart and without a horizon, waiting in the registration and identification camp for their asylum papers, either to be accepted or to be rejected. And they share living uh, spaces with people they do not know, and many times people who do not even speak their language. What we're witnessing today at this moment is that within the past two weeks, a very large number of people fled their homes to protect themselves and their children. As one Ukrainian mother stated in a UNHCR report, we were suddenly refugees. In Poland alone, more than uh, 1.5 million refugees entered seeking for safety, and they're given temporary shelter in large sports hall or refugee camps. In this environment, children of course have no space of their own, do not know other children, have nothing to do, um, uh, no activities, of course, and there is a big why, because they do not know, they do not comprehend all this um, situation that's going on around them. Um, and uh, although we, uh, we know that children can be very resilient and uh, they can often cope with uh, very difficult experiences in healthy and productive ways, Exposure to traumatic events can affect them variously. We might witness changes in their behavior. Uh, they might be more sensitive to ways that others behave, more irritable. They might fluctuate emotions, experience sleep disturbances, exhibit elevated anxiety, and much more. This lack of stability, security, infrastructure, or, and of psychosocial support makes music therapy as a strength-based approach a valuable and much needed intervention within these camps. From the previous presentations, it is very clear that when we work with people who are experiencing a disaster that has abruptly, unexpectedly, and uncontrollably altered lives, as music therapists, we need to be very sensitive and approach them with empathy. The PFA principles, just as Barb um, really thoroughly analyzed them, uh, for children, focus on three uh, actions, look, listen, and connect. And these actions are in order to promote the five uh, grounding elements, safety, calmness, connectedness, community, self and community efficacy, and hope. Each of these stages can be effectively addressed within music therapy. Briefly, the three actions include look, which means checking for safety issues, observing for potential threats within that environment, finding a safe place to communicate with children, attending to obvious needs first, and then moving to listen, which includes approaching children, asking about their needs, listening to them, provide a sense of calmness, and responding with empathy, 
to what the children have to say. It's important that we are focusing on their needs and not the disaster while talking to them initially. And connect. Once we make sure basic and specific needs are covered, then we move on to music therapy groups as psychosocial support in order to strengthen resiliency, promote feelings of hope, and enhance connectivity among children. It is important to inform them also of the next time we will be there. Each situation, of course, differs. I'm sharing my experience. You should adapt, select, and use whatever you find helpful. My main concern with all groups has been that children have needs that are not addressed while living for a short or a longer period in a transit camp. This, um, this location hides many developmental threats. And as children, they need to feel safe to continue education, to play, to have normality in their lives that will foster their growth. My, the theory behind uh, the approach uh, actually can be traced back to Bowlby, Winnicott, Bronfenbrenner, uh, Van der Kolk, but I will not talk about theory. I decided to just share photos um, that will just um, uh, accompany the narration in order to give you the sense of the music therapy groups. Photos used have been shot in public places and with the consent of the UNHCR representative at HEOS at that time. I have pixelated though the faces of the children um, to secure anonymity. So how do we approach and start providing music therapy services in this context? Before we start, there is one significant step. If we are not familiar with uh, refugee camps and have no previous experience, we first need to familiarize ourselves with this particular living circumstance. We need plenty of observation time to, wear a bit, to be aware of the conditions, to understand and feel the field, to assess the needs from a distance before we jump in and attempt to offer music therapy. In addition, all necessary permissions need to be granted. May that be the UNHCR, the police, uh, the local authority, whoever might be running the camp, especially if one goes as a volunteer as I was and not affiliated with an NGO. Providing now music therapy in camps gives us the possibility of running various types of groups, open to all children, open to certain age groups, or even groups provided for a specific subgroup depending on their needs. We assess their needs, and as was mentioned earlier, even just sitting and listening is enough sometimes. It all depends on how we organize the groups and the space that we have available. Uh, the space is a big issue. Um, in makeshift refugee camps or large uh, places, finding a place to set up for music therapy can be quite difficult. Usually there is no free or open uh, area available. We need to be in close collaboration with the authorities to ensure that a space will be provided within the camp. If there is an available room or um, an empty container in the camp, then we can actually ask to use it and uh, have um, a controlled with certain, uh, with a number of uh, children group. Um, but we have to find one so that we can have uh, a group for children with specific needs. If there is no available room or a private place, we need to delimit and define the music therapy space in another way. These groups that I'm going to talk about are open to all in nature. Another element to consider is language. We can use English. We can use our native language. We can use the children's native language if we know it. We can have interpreters, but as Liz mentioned, I agree, they, uh, oftentimes they are just one more person. But we need to be sensitive to the ways that the children prefer to communicate. It is very important to respect their culture and have a culturally sensitive music therapy approach. Empathy, but particularly cultural empathy, is an important quality for a music therapy working with refugee populations. And once we decide to start music therapy groups, we have to assess the needs of the children and of the different ages and plan accordingly our music therapy interventions. 
What I saw in the camps, once children see that a group will be formed, they approach on their own free will and join in. The numbers might vary anywhere from 10 up to 100 children, even more, depending on how big the camp is. So open to all groups were what work best at transit camps with many refugees, what I saw from my experience here. In these groups, all children are free to come and free to go as they desire. Yet I rarely saw children leaving the group. A way to define the space outdoors is with the use of tarpaulins, that's waterproof plastic canvases, about four by six meters long uh, wide for children to sit and form a circle within this area. Depending on the number of children, the tarpaulins might be one, two, three, or even four. Even if we have uh, informed of a date and time, refugees in the transit camp experience a reality that does not help keep track of time. They do not, uh, all days are one and the same. One way so to inform children of um, a group is to just place the tarpaulins and on them, we place three to four meters of paper and spread many colorful markers. On their own initiative, children come, sit and start drawing. That is a great way for them to communicate in a non-verbal manner and letting us know how they are. We can see a lot from the themes that they pick to draw. Once we approach a child, we introduce ourselves. We lean down to be on the child's level when talking or engaging in music with him or her. And we incorporate any form of touch only if that is comfortable or appreciated by the child. While they're drawing, we sit next to them and start conversations with each one to get to know them and determine their emotional state. In order to give each child his or her place to draw, and um, we make divisions. And in the middle, as you can see, we make divisions in the paper. And in the middle, we write the word welcome or a different word, friends, uh, in their language, in our language, in English, and this arrangement has children form a circle uh, around the long sheet of paper. And once they're about to conclude the drawings, then the music begins. Songs that we use need to be culturally appropriate. And in a case of a shared language, which, which was not the case here, in the case of a shared language, it is possible to delve deeper in meaning and musical experience through songs of that culture. Um, if as has been the case here in Ahios Island, children are from many different cultures. What I have seen working is easy African songs that can be a very good starting point for the children to start uh, expressing the, their voice. Musical instruments are also something children really like. Yet we need to keep in mind that if we provide instruments, at the end, we need to collect them and we risk uh, disappointing the children who have left all their stuff behind and are in need of owning something. That is the reason I have used handmade instruments, as you can see in the photo. Maracas from toilet paper, uh, tube, balloon maracas, loomy sticks from tree branches, um, instruments that make very um, quiet sounds so that the children can take them when the group is over. The groups aim at enhancing social skills, build a sense of community and help children sustain hope in their life. What I have seen um, these groups actually uh, accomplish a lot is um, giving them a way of meeting each other, of um, getting to know one another. Oftentimes when we go to a refugee camp, a very large number of children gather and we need to have a team. They do not necessarily need to be a team of music therapists. We, we run the group and our team members participate in the group, forming some strong links in the circle and help with the music, the flow of music actually. So to give you an overview, uh, the open to all music group interventions that have found effective have the following steps. After finding an appropriate space, placing a tarpaulin and setting the specific space for the intervention, the taped long pieces of paper act as a gathering agent that facilitate individual work within a group setting and foster concentration, involvement over time, a sense of quietness and stability, 
and provide an avenue to express averted traumatic experiences. As the children are already in a circle, music begins. To facilitate gradual engagement, the autoharp provides a non-threatening one-on-one interaction. A hello song sets the stage, group singing starts, and call and response songs continue. The songs used in the beginning, as I mentioned before, are African songs with easy syllabic structure and repetitive lyrics and melodies um, in a way that they ensure success in the learning experience. After four or five songs are taught, are learned, then based on the rhythms of the songs, simple uh, rhythmic patterns are introduced, either as actions to the songs or with body percussion or a simple musical instrument. When the group's energy level and synchronicity is um, uh, in singing and tapping rhythms is good, then the sitting down circle becomes a standing up circle. So they start moving also their body, incorporating in the singing body movements, voice and breathing. The group ends with a ritual of a simple goodbye song leading to a synchronized loud voices. At the end, all children uh, help in putting away the tarpaulins. What I have seen though through these groups is um, how they transform the, the strange environment of a, a transit camp to a more friendly environment for the children. I was talking about today's webinar with Ioana Etnechoglu. Uh, she's a colleague of mine, a music therapist, and various themes emerged during our discussion. Uh, so I decided to bring in uh, the picture, some aspect that I feel might differentiate the present situation from the transit camps where I have run groups. Many refugee children from Ukraine have fled their country only with their mothers. Since from what we read in the news, males from 18 to 60 years of age have stayed behind to defend their homeland. This absence of a father figure is another loss that we need to take under consideration. It might be good to invite the mothers to participate in the music therapy groups, provide them an avenue for self-expression and focus on their empowerment since they are taking on both paternal and maternal roles in these uncertain and insecure times. Especially with young mothers who have babies or toddlers, music therapy can be a valuable intervention. Before I conclude, I want to mention one last issue that I consider very critical, which is already mentioned, I think, by all of you. And this is supervision and um, the, the team bodies. Uh, when working with refugees, uh, it is a very emotionally demanding uh, work and supervision really helps. And uh, it is important to acknowledge that we cannot do everything. Oftentimes we cannot help the way we'd like. And we realize when we are on the field that there is so much that we cannot address due to the circumstances. It is imperative for us to be able to appreciate that what we can offer is okay, it is enough. Even if it's just one child, even if what we're offering is a window of light in their still life. Thank you. And uh, I'm passing it on to Barb again. And if you have questions. Thank you, Mitzi. I noticed in uh, one of the photographs, the children were at the standing stage in the group and there look to be parents on the, or, or guardians around the peripheral. The importance of their ability to observe their children in connected with other peers uh, is so helpful for secondary stress that they may be experiencing. And I just wanted to point that out and thank you. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And um, I will pass it uh, back to my other colleagues, Liz and Maria, if they have any comments and over to Indra for any questions. Really wonderful presentation, Mitzi. Um, I really like the idea of the tarpaulin as a gathering agent, sort of a silent agent as well, or just something that um, means that the children have got to notice it and how it's just it's just it's just pulled them in. Um, because I think <clears throat> the sort of multi arts aspect of that is is really helpful because you, you're offering um, not just the music but a whole creative experience. And I, I was talking about creativity. You know mm -hmm. how that that's su such an important part of things so that that's just great to hear you know in Maria's presentation she talked about the children doing pictures of trees 
and sharing them because all the trees were gone. And Maria and her partner allowed them to pick what was important to them. The fact that the trees weren't there and she allowed them and facilitated how, what do you want to do about it? Well, let's make some trees. And that's what you did. Well done, Maria. Unmute, Maria. Um, as Mitzi, thank you, Barb. Uh, as Mitzi mentioned, you really have to meet the clients where they are at. And I think it's very challenging working with, with large groups, as uh, I can imagine in a refugee camp, uh, where conditions are very, um, in a way, they are safer, I guess, but they are very unpredictable as well. So um, the, the fact that you, uh, you sort of give yourself to whatever is happening, it's very important. And uh, when I, uh, Liz has mentioned creativity many times, and that's, you know, that's, that was sort of the, the base uh, of sanity that we had when, we, when we've done our work. I think it's very important to, to, to think, you know, within yourself, what are your strengths and what are your weaknesses? But from that, you can, you know, um, you can do something. And I think it's, uh, we cannot take everything into account. We cannot um, cater to every needs, you know, of, of people but we definitely uh, can give, um, I think Liz mentioned or, or Mitzi mentioned it, you know, if it's one child, one parent, uh, one family that we can uh, offer a safe space and, and a little hope for the future, even if it's for a few minutes. So I think uh, that's what I mean when I say, you know, just be there, just be like a sponge and, and just be there without any expectations. In the... Mitzi. Ah. Sorry. Ah, in Go the ahead. it, uh, what we have seen here in the transit camps, um, of course, we might have an open group, and we might have a hundred children that we only see once or maybe twice, and that was when uh, the refugees were able to move on because Hios was never their uh, place of destination. They so ev ev or we might have children come to the groups for a year because they're there for a year. And uh, that also changes the way that you work with the children. Uh, but I've seen that they really are in, um, in great need of uh, an activity or of um, a group that will make them feel safe and that will make the, the environment feel um, more pleasant. These are not nice, I mean, you've seen pictures. Uh, I, I suspect you all know how transit refugee camps are. They're not a nice place for children to live, even for a short time. So one needs to um, make room, uh, you know, to, to have uh, nicer feelings, even if it's just for an hour. I think um, Mitzi highlighted the, the flight phase coming to the transit camp and then the, the departure phase too. But when she mentioned the word flight, it uh, immediately reminded me of the activated fight or flight amygdala part of the brain, fight, flight, or freeze. And uh, Liz was talking about some children who weren't even speaking. They were in a frozen state first. So depending on the phase of recovering and the phase of the emergency, you may see some of those uh, fundamental survival responses for some time. And that's not unusual. And you may see developmental regressions as well, particularly in young children, uh, potty training, bathroom training, that kind of thing. Um, that's not uncommon. Thank you so much for those uh, incredible presentations. Now that we've heard from our four amazing panelists, let us now proceed to the next important part of this webinar, the question and answer session. Are you ready for our participants' questions, dear panelists? Please feel free to interject and answer as you see fit. We have some really great questions. The first question is coming from Chris, and this is his question. Do the presenters have any experiences with using relaxation techniques with traumatized refugees? 
I'm asking because I know that that kinds of receptive techniques sometimes could be too strong and overwhelming. It looks that using active techniques seems to be more safe. So could the presenters share their experiences about it? Yeah, I, this is Barb. I, I agree. Um, brief, active uh, breathing and relaxation techniques are the only ones that I've used because most of my interactions are very short. And then I'll pass it to Maria because she actually just talked through a very, a very simple one. Um, and using sound or an acoustic environment that's going to be grounding. Um, there are some uh, tips in the psychological first aid manual uh, related to activation and feeling overwhelmed. So I'm wearing, I'm wearing a necklace I've worn often. It's just a little piece of jade um, and providing someone and cueing them to have a visual, a visual cue for that relaxation and breathing exercise. And I've used the necklace. This is helpful. Just look at the necklace, focus on that. With children, point out two or three things in the room that you notice. If they're verbal, show me something that's yellow in the room. If I know there's something obviously yellow because it orients them to the space and time. And then we incorporate that into the breathing exercise. Um, Maria, you were gonna say something? Uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, it could be kind of tricky if you put people in, in, uh, in a relaxation state that they don't have anything to be grounded to. So that's why I usually start with, you know, with slow movement, whether it's sitting on a chair or, you know, if, I, if people feel like walking around the room and, you know, just guiding the experience through that and, uh, you know, feeling your body or, or looking at the person next, next to you. I think that uh, that really gives a sense of, um, of being like contained, but also being free to, move or or contact your body in any way you want um, also having a uh, music and imagery uh, it's very help helpful and and guiding to a to a comfortable image or, or to a beautiful image uh, that everybody can hold on to because just having the music and you know just kind of letting go uh, or doing a relaxation through the music that could at the end be very unsettling so um that could be maybe for a later stage where when people are really um, are going through, you know, what what's happening to them. But at the beginning, I think it's a uh, grounding in any way you can. It's very important. I want to mention uh, for Chris, for me as a responder, um, when <clears throat> when I return from deployments, I always seek clinical supervision. I always seek counseling. I see a therapist who's a fellow with the Association of Music and Imagery. And so I do guided imagery and music for myself. And I must say, I've gone into that, um, my colleague providing that service for me, thinking, oh, I'm fine. And then I've gone through that arc of the guided imagery and music and things will come up that I wasn't consciously aware of that I needed to process. So I think that more, um, indwelling, in-depth introspection for the responder and you as therapists who are trained can be extremely useful, but I've not used it um, in the phases of response that I've worked in because it wasn't appropriate at that phase. Can I just also um, chip in with something there, which is that depending on the culture of the, um, of, of the group of people you're working with, relaxation means different things and has different meanings. So I think that's also something to really think about. Whereas, you know, uh, to when, when there may be a, an overarching concept of what relaxation or a certain emotion looks like. I think Mitzi, you were talking about, you know, different people respond in different ways to, to a crisis. Maria also that some people may be laughing or, you know, you know, you know there are very, very different ways of, of responding to these things. And I think on a couple of occasions when I, I've, you know, tried some relaxation um, exercises with certain client groups from certain countries, it's it's rapidly proved that that's not an appropriate, uh, it's nothing that they've got that experience of and they're not ready for it at that moment. So 
uh, as I say, cultural considerations also need to be need to be thought about. Thank you so much for that. The next question is from Carmen, and I think it's a really, really great question. This is what Carmen asks. In case of a war, how do you act when two opposite countries are in the same room? I think, I think about um, the humanitarian aid and purpose that we're there for and that we respect people and the individuals and we're there because we care. So I try, I try to make that clear. I've only had that situation with the Red Cross when I've been at the table helping with translation through multiple languages for um, uh, refugees from Africa. So we were doing a four language translation to help find some displaced people. And there were people from opposite sides of the conflict. And we sit and discussed very briefly as a team in multiple languages, why we're here. And it's because we care and we want to connect people together. And that is all. Would anybody else like to elaborate on that? Thank you so much, Barbara. Uh, yeah, following uh, what Barbara said, um, I think uh, you know some of us have been confronted in uh, in many political turmoils, you know, in in, in their countries, um, whether it ends up in a war situation or not. But I think we daily uh, might be in a room with people that think very different, that have different political or religious uh, views, and they could be very very strong about it. But as Barb says, I think we are we are just an instrument there, you know, to, to be able to um, somehow sensibilize everybody um, and help them get through uh, an activity that it's musical uh, or something related to that, but not to be discussing you know the different ideas because even through music if you if you have people listening to three pieces of different types of music everybody is going to feel different about it you know some people will love it some people will hate it so i think taking it from from the musical stand you know people will realize that uh, they have different ideas uh, and different views but it could be okay i mean it doesn't mean that it's it's right or wrong i think it's it's a way on how expressing that idea that you know uh, we might help to um to facilitate and i i also want to uh, stress something on what liz uh, mentioned about cultural you know the cultural sensitivity in this panel we have four people uh, of different parts of the world literally and uh, i think we have a lot of uh, things in common, you know, the way we approach, but we are also very aware of the differences. And and when when we were actually preparing for this uh, presentation, which was very, very um, fast, you know, uh, Indra is very effective in getting things together. <laughs> Thank you, Indra, for that and, the, and Anita. Um, but I think we also, uh, we really, cherish the differences that we have among each other uh, you know and sometimes we might be um, according uh, we might be you know in tune with what we are saying but sometimes not you know agree or not agree so I think that's that's the beauty of, uh, of having a cross-cultural presentation right now because we can touch a little bit you know of everything and we are not that different at the end. I would like to add something. I've had um, two or three instances now that I'm bringing him to my to my memory. Um, there are some um, um, in my groups, in the groups that we had in the camps, uh, people, uh, children were from uh, various different countries and not all countries are um, have very good relations between them. Um, one thing that we stre we never, um, when we, okay, when we were uh, standing, we, um, I, I would never ask children to hold hands so that each child would be within a circle, but with his or her space. Um, also, 
uh, when we were drawing, each child had his or her space, which was very important, um, in a group with uh, unaccompanied adolescents, which was um, a controlled music therapy group in a, a caravan, in a container that was uh, um, handed to me for six months. Uh, when we had a, a conflict between, again, um, adolescents from different countries, uh, we just dealt, uh, uh, we spoke about it, we talked about it, we brought the issue out, and um, the same like we would um, solve a conflict resolution um, type of way within a music therapy session. And uh, after talking, we ended up playing it with music. So I think we, there are ways and um, we find people that uh, have some difficulties because of the cultural backgrounds and everything that they bring with them in the group. Uh, but I think they all work out because they are, the, the, the baseline is that they all live in the same situation. They are at the same um, spot. Um, in their lives. So I don't know if that helps. But... Thank you so much for that, let's see. I would like to quickly pass the time over to Anita, who has also some questions from the YouTube channel. Anita, could you please go ahead? Sure, we have been watching the comments on the YouTube channel as well. And I can just simply answer those questions right now, as far as this is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel for further viewing and sharing. There are many other videos on our YouTube channel that you might find of interest as well. And if you are interested in helping refugees in this situation or any others, feel free to contact Indra at crisis at WFMT.info. I will put that uh, email in the chat on Zoom, and it is already in the messages on YouTube. So thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Anita. Before we end today's seminar, I was wondering if there's any last thoughts, perhaps, that our panelists would like to share as a word of inspiration and encouragement to our wonderful music therapists and fellow professionals who have taken the trouble to attend today's webinar. I think what I'd like to share is that I think music therapists have an amazing range of skills that really fit well into these difficult situations. We are highly trained in observing, in listening, in waiting for the right moment, because we're musicians, we're adaptable and we're flexible. Uh, and those are all things that, as we've seen in some of the, uh, the presentations, the things that have been said, that are really needed um, for people who are in this situation. Um, and I also think the other thing that we've all, we've all emphasized is about self-care, support for you. This is very difficult and very challenging work. And... If you can't look after other people if you don't look after yourself. I know that's something that time and time we're told when we're training, um, but it's it's never been more important right now. Um, it's not just these, these people who are in immediate need, but the ripple effects um, for people who have had past experiences uh, in you know, conflict, um, people who are being triggered, you know, people who are in fear, school children who are in countries distant from this current conflict, who are afraid, who are, who are in fear, who are not understanding what's going on. Um, you know, there's going to be a lot of work to be done. And, and I think we're really well placed to make a global effort in supporting that. This is an ongoing crisis and it's going to evolve quickly and new questions and needs may occur over time. And I think uh, having these connections and these kinds of uh, meetings, formal or informal, um, is uh, critically important. And I'm just honored to be with everybody here and uh, all the attendees um, on online. Thank you.
Mireya, would you like to share? Well, I think my colleagues have said it all. And um, I think it's very, very great that we are here together today because, uh, you know, there's wars happening all over the place. We have a... Uh, we have a crisis with COVID everywhere, um, you know, so it's, uh, I think people live trauma and crisis in different ways. So um, we have to be aware of that uh, and very sensitive to to how we ourselves as music therapists are, are going through this and, you know, how we can um, help ourselves um, or contain ourselves in our work, but also uh, to be aware that, um, Ukraine is one country among many that are, are suffering right now, and, and we really have to pay attention to that. So I really hope we, we are able to, uh, within our limits, of course, to be able to support, uh, you know, to, to have an ongoing support for everyone and, you know, start collaborations as well. Yeah, I, I, I agree, Mireya. It's uh, really important to um, have a network and um, to know that one is not alone, which is something that I felt living in the middle of nowhere. And um, it's uh, really important to be able to network with uh, uh, other music therapists around the world um, who can help give support or offer ideas, um, just be a soundboard of our uh, thoughts. Um, I really uh, changed a lot uh, through uh, working with refugees. So if uh, someone here uh, listening with us uh, has refugees coming to their country and is able to help and provide, I sincerely say you should do it. Um, they are in great need and uh, it will be valuable work for you as well. That's, I changed a lot through it. So, Thank you very much, WFMT. It was a really a wonderful uh, initiative, and I hope you continue, um, Anita, with all the work and Indra, wonderful bringing us together. Thank you. On behalf of the WFMT, I would like to express our heartfelt thanks to Barb, Lisa, Mireya, and Mitzi for your incredibly illuminating and insightful sharing. We have now come to the end of our webinar and to our wonderfully attentive participants, thank you for the important work that you are all doing around the world. We see you and we appreciate you. Please follow our updates on the WFMP social media as there are initiatives in process and you can contact me with any questions or possible collaborations to support all who have been affected by the Ukrainian crisis. Last but not least, I would like to acknowledge the important contributions and support of the World Federation of Music Therapy Council members, many of whom are here today. I would also like to give a special shout out to the Global Crisis Intervention Commission Committee members and the American Music Therapy Association International Relations Committee who have all contributed significantly towards the organization of this webinar. Last but not least, I also want to say a big thank you to Dr. Juan Pedro Zabolini for stepping in to help us with this technical platform. My greatest uh, gratitude to Dr. Anita Swanson for being here every step of the way and to all of you. Goodbye, take care and stay safe.